the FCC may soon rule on the switch from restrictive type of communications over the more reasonable bandwidth limitations for amateur communications. FM voices and slow scan TV are modest bandwidth. Uh, single sideband voice has a skinny bandwidth. And the ultra narrowest bandwidth of all, and all these answers, is CW or Morse code. Even through the code, test for CW has been eliminated for all the classes of ham licenses. CW will always be popular, ultra narrow way of communicating. I hope all of you will try some CW down the world, uh, down the worldwide portion of your technician class privileges on 80, 40, 15, and 10. When you switch your multi-mode uh, multi rig over to CW, you'll want to see that the bandwidth narrows down. This minimizes the pickup of other CW frequencies or off frequencies at 150 hertz. It's just right. So when you go into your computer and your software, once you get comfortable doing it, the computer really does about, I'd say, 85% of your work. You don't have to worry. And the, the radio, depending on the radio you get, you can, like my icon, you can preset where you want to be on, on that band. For Morse code CW, we restrict the bandwidth down to a skinny 400 hertz. Anything wider would bring in uh, a lot of noise. Again, when you switch your worldwide radio to CW, the narrower 500 hertz band, uh, bandwidth filter automatically clicks in. On 6 and 10 meters, single sideband and CW, the worldwide radio offers bandwidth choices. When you change modes on your radio, will automatically tighten up or expand the internal bandwidth filter selection. This is allows you to maximize the noise and minimize the noise and maximize the long range reception. But that's going to be important. When you click it in, it's going to automatically tighten it up or expand it. The ability of a receiver to detect a weak signal is known as sensitivity. For effective HF radio communications, an operator must receive, uh, the receiver must have a power gain of approximately 1 million or 10 million to 1, or about 70 decibels as measured at the antenna terminals. To bring in the mag uh, medium strength HF signal to a comfortable listening level with a set of earphones. As daunting as this task may seem, it is sort of sensitivity is extremely easy to achieve with a modern electronic components. <coughs> the mixer. It is a nonlinear device that makes two signals injected into and creates both the sums and the differences of any two radio signals. A simple diode can act as a mixer, but most modern day radios use more elegant arrangements using several diodes and active devices such as transistors, uh, F FETs or FETs, uh, to create a mixer circuit board. Mixers are essentially, uh, to nearly every modern radio design and are crucial to the overall performance of the radio in most cases. The capability of a radio, of any radio equipment, is to specifically hear one frequency and discriminate against signals on the other side of that frequency. It's called selectivity. On VHF, UHF equipment, the selectivity is usually preset, and most equipment is plenty sensitive. On the worldwide uh, radio gear, you can sometimes add more filters for increased sensitivity, while additional filters may cut down on the fidelity of a, a received signal so you can tighten up the receiver's response. AGC, Automatic Gain Control, formerly known as the AVC, or Automatic Volume Control. This is used to somewhat level out the huge variation in signals, uh, signal strength. A signal can undergo between the distance station on its way to you. The AGC bus is also used in most radios to drive the S meter. AGC system can range from rudimentary to extremely sophisticated with varieties of attack time, decay time, hang time, and other parameters, all for the purpose of making HF reception more effective and over a widely varying conditions. Don't go out and buy one. 
your radio equipment already has an excellent built-in preamplifier. I would have to agree, most radios I either used, borrowed, or seen, they really do. Uh, only if you purchase a very old radio with a noticeably weak reception would you consider an external amplifier. The preamp goes in between the antenna input and the receiver. Be careful how you wire it. It is simply put into the outside of the equipment and the first time you transmit the preamp is history. It either needs to be external switching or must be placed inside of the equipment between the antenna line and the receiver section. Many folks become ham radio operators from their experience on the CB. Some of their 27 megahertz equipment may be modified and tied into actual device called transverters that make 11 meter signal now coming in at 222. To reverse this process, you will, have, you will also need to be receiving converter or down converter, which takes the 220 megahertz receive signal and down converts it to a 27 or 28 receiver front end frequency. Uh, why you would do that, I don't know. I came from the CB, I got stuff. I didn't want to mess with it. It's, it's anymore today, things are disposable. You drop one of these, you can't really get, you can't get inside it to fix it anyway. So, I mean, if, if I do drop it and destroy it, I've destroyed it, you know. So, just buying a, a, a new two meter would, would suffice. But people like tinkering, so there's nothing wrong with that. Well, there are transverters which will perform both functions in a simple package. You can assume that all transverters work on the receive side. Never try to run your 12 volt equipment directly from a battery charger <laughs> or attempt to transmit with your handheld when it's plugged into the wall adapter. If you plan to run your equipment off a of commercial power with it still plugged in and always use a regulated power supply, which is what my kit will run off of either a power supply or I have a huge battery to make it totally portable. So if I have juice, I use the power supply. If not, I'm running the battery. It uh, regulated power supply and it protects your gear from voltage fluctuations. A regulated power supply plugs into the AC wall outlet and then your radio plugs into the power supply. The greatest cause of handheld transmit hum and sometimes damage to the equipment is trying to transmit with a still plugged into the AC receptacle power adapter. So basically, it goes to your wall, your equipment, just like your car battery gets plugged in, hot and ground. So, you guys are going to ace this one too. What is a transceiver? Which of the following devices is most useful for VHF, weak signal communication? B. B. What type of voice mode is often used for long distant weak signal contacts and VHF and UHF bands? What is the preliminary advantage of single sideband over V, uh, FM? for voice transmissions. See? Which of the following is a form of amplitude modulation? Which sideband is normally used for 10 meter VHF, UHF, and HF single sideband communication? Which of the following describes a, uh, the combining of speech with an RF carrier signal? Oscillation? Modulation. Yep. What is the approximate bandwidth of a single sideband voice signal?
Free. Yeah. Yeah. Math. Well, geez, you guys only nailed like 99%, so. <laughs> Which of the following is an appropriate receive filter bandwidth? I'm going to skip you right there, huh? Which of the following is true of the use of SSB phone in amateur band above 50? Got an A, and I got a C. Some portion. <laughs> Some portion. Remember, you got three tiers of license. You got your technician, general. So technician is kind of like this. General kind of opens up to that, and then the extra is about that much more, and then you get everything. Which of the following controls would you be used uh, to Pitch of a single sideband signal seems to be high or low. A. D. Of course. RIT. What does the term RIT mean? A. You got an A, you got a B. B. B's got it. <laughs> Which of the following is true concerning the microphone connector on an amateur transceiver? Two slides back, it says not all Motorola, Yesu, Bofank, not everybody does the same. I wish they would make life a lot easier. But you know, neither does Ford, Chevy, or Dodge, or nobody else. So, what's the name of a circuit that generates a signal on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Might as well not even finish these. <laughs> Which of the following types of emissions has the narrowest bandwidth? What is the approximate maths maximum bandwidth required to transmit a CW signal? Which of the following is appropriate receive filter bandwidth to select in order to minimize noise and interference for a CW reception? What is the advantage of having multiple receive bandwidth choices on a multi-mode transceiver? Matching the mode. So, permits the noise or interference reduction by selecting a bandwidth matching the mode. Which term describes the ability to receive or detect a, the presence of a signal? Sensitivity. Which is following used to convert a radio signal from the frequency from one frequency to another. B. Which term describes the ability of a receiver to discriminate between multiple signals? So one is selectiveness. <laughs> What is the function of an automatic gain control or AGC? Just 
there's always two questions that don't make sense. I don't think I spoke of anything about lightning, so we can remove that one. Automatic gain control. Is it to keep the audio constant? Protect the uh, from lightning or some such thing? To eliminate the RF on a station cabling? Is that your final answer? What is an RF preamplifier installed? Where is it installed? What device takes the output of a low-powered 28 megahertz uh, single sideband exciter? What is transfer? Hmm? Uh, Which is a good reason to use a regulated power supply for communications equipment? <coughs> that was awesome. Hearing me up there? Uh, that's good. Wait until I start yelling. <laughs> Are you already being in red? <laughs> uh, that must mean I got a big mouth, huh? <laughs> All right, can you hear me up in the back there? Good. All right, electrons go with the flow. Think of it as voltage as pressure in a kitchen plumbing. Open the valve, turn the switch, the current begins to flow. The pressure is voltage and the trickle of water should be similar to current. All right, so if you, if you picture your voltage and stuff as a water hose, you know, the current going through the water hose, you know, that's how you're going to get it. But electron, electrons go with the flow. Uh, like we mentioned the other day, uh, everything in the red is what you want to try and catch, grasp the uh, so theory behind. Voltage is the measure of current. Voltage is the measure of voltage uh, and, and current, yes. Uh, they got you know different names for a few different things here that you'll, you'll get in a minute. Another name for voltage is the electron, electromotive force. Uh, the force may be with you, voltage, all right, so. Another name for electromotive, uh, electromotive force is voltage. We measure voltage with a voltmeter. We test for voltage by hooking up the meter across the source without undoing any wires. It's called a parallel connection. That's where it goes on the positive and negative, and your positive and negative are still going to your equipment. Checking the voltage when operating equipment is called checking the voltage source under load. Rechargeable batteries are sometimes known as secondary cells. Many new wonderful types of rechargeable batteries make portable and emergency amateur radio operations more practical than ever. NICAD batteries, nickel, metal, hydride, commonly used in HTs, commonly used in a lot of stuff now. Uh, and lithium ion is found in step up HT battery systems. Lead acid gel cells are still used. Uh, they're good for backup power. All of these rechargeable batteries use different types of chargers. Uh, be sure to use the right battery for your particular particular device and the right charger for that battery. Always follow safety warnings. It's important on the batteries to make sure you use the right charger. Um, I, I recently found out that with a uh, <clears throat> battery for one of my lawn equipment. And I'll be buying a new battery now. <laughs> Luckily, you won't find any handhelds shipped with carbon zinc or non-rechargeable batteries. 
Alkalide and carbon zinc batteries only work once and should be properly disposed of when depleted. Alkaline individual cells make up, make up a good battery source for HTs that come with, with a battery tray. Battery trays have no contacts on the bottom to accidentally put them in a fast charge cycle, a recharge cycle. Alkaline cells must never be recharged. All right, the standard batteries you buy from the store, unless they say rechargeable on them, don't try charging them. Most mobile transceivers run off of 12 volts DC. If you're purchasing a handheld, be sure to buy the inexpensive 12 volt DC adapter. Uh, this, plugs into, this plugs into the accessory socket on your vehicle and will nicely power a handheld. Do not use a secondary or an accessory socket to power anything more than just a handheld. Okay, you can power your cell phone too. They'll let you do that. I won't tell you my car is car radio, the 50 watt radio is powered through my cigarette lighter. Uh, ham radio power leads need to be connected directly to the battery source. This means positive to the positive terminal and a negative battery terminal to the negative terminal or to the nearby engine block ground strap. This will minimize alternator whine and whistles. Also be sure the power cable is fused at the battery. Automotive batteries are capable of supplying tremendous current. And the last thing you want to do is create an automotive meltdown as a result of a malfunctioning or improperly installed mobile ham station. Um, as far as the fused part, okay, they recommend putting the fuse just after the battery. All right. Um, a lot of radios, sometimes you'll see the fuses up near the radio. Add one near the battery if you're hooking directly to the battery. All right, only because if something chafes your wire while you're driving along, if it shorts out, you want the, you want the wire to kick that fuse rather than burn all the way back to the battery. Think of the flow of electronic, or electrons as a flow of water in a, in, a, in a stream. If you get out there in the midstream, you will feel the current. Again, electrons moving is current. Current is measured in amperes. That's the unit of current. We use an amp meter to measure electrical current. An amp meter measures current. To measure current, turn off the power, disconnect one lead from the source voltage, for example, at the fuse holder. Insert the amp meter in series with the lead. If you're measuring DC current, you will need to connect the meter with the correct polarity so the meter reads upscale when the power is turned on. Never connect an amp meter directly across the voltage source. You will either fry your meter or blow a rather expensive fuse. In every electronic class I've ever taught, two or three students just have to try this out and see for themselves. An amp meter appears as a dead short to any voltage source. Okay. Uh, remember the, the meter checking checking your voltage. Your, meet, your meter voltage meter goes directly across the terminals, positive negative, for voltage. If you're checking for amperage, it goes in series. Um, I'm not going to get into showing you what series is, but if you're not sure what it is, look it up, and check it out because it's two different, entirely different things. Well, they're going to show you. 
right. What do we got here? All right, this one's checking. That's checking for amperage. All right. They've got one connection on the positive terminal. The other one goes to the positive of the light bulb uh, in a, to, to make a series connection. So they're checking for the amperage from that battery to the light bulb. The flow of electronic ele electrons in, the, in a conductor is called current. Current is measured in amperes. Amperes is also referred to as amps. Most wire is copper. It's a good conductor. Some relays use uh, gold or silver plated contacts. They're also great conductors. You can use aluminum foil as a ground plane. It also is a good conductor. Glass, wood, and rubber are insulators. All right. Aluminum. <laughs> Just a side note, aluminum foil, if you have a, uh, say a SUV, like the old Jeeps with the hard plastic roofs, you want to put an antenna on it, drill the hole through the center of that plastic, put a sheet of aluminum foil underneath it to make a ground plane, and you got a great antenna. Have you ever been bitten by a hot power cord? Think back to the shocking time. Recall your accidental zap feeling, much like a buzz. It is exactly that, alternating current, reversing direction 60 times a second. So besides the shock, that tingling buzz is the feeling of alternating current. Has anybody ever had that? All right. Uh, it's much easier than if you get it from a DC volt circuit, you know? But all, you gotta remember, alternating current, all right? That's one thing they're gonna want. If they happen to, I don't know if they're gonna show a picture of it or not, but if they happen to show a picture of it, alternating current is gonna go up, down below the center line, and to the bottom and back up. That's alternating. Uh, DC won't do that. DC will go one, one side and that's it. Most ham equipment work off a DC voltage. The way we transform household AC power into DC is with a rectifier circuit. The rectifier uses diodes to block the full house power AC cycle, leading to a varying direct current signal. Capacitors are used to filter and smooth out the fluctuating DC current. Thanks to the rectifier circuit, we can change AC to varying DC. Right. And it's, it's just basically telling you what a rectifier does. It smooths out the DC, fluctuating DC current. <coughs> Batteries generate direct current. Even though a current may vary in value, it is always flows in the same direction. It is a direct current, but are known as DC current. The process of changing AC to pulsating DC is called for rectification. It's a big word. We use a diode in the circuit to allow current to flow in one direction only the dial, much like a check valve, stops the flow from when it tries to go in the, the reverse direction. Again, going back to your water hose, you put a check valve in there, the water can only go one way. It can't back flow into your, your house. Uh, so diodes, current flows one direction. And that is a picture of the diode and the parts of a diode. First take a look at the symbol for the diode. The cathroid is represented by the short straight line at the tip of the arrow. And the anode is represented by the arrow itself. 
Now think backwards. Current flows in the opposite direction of the arrow from the cathode to the anoid. Uh, forward bias. There's also no current flow in the direction of the arrow from the anoid to the cathode. In a silicone diode, it takes about half a volt for conduction. Not much room on a tiny diode to put a a letter or a word to indicate the, ca the cathode end. So there's a tiny stripe. All right, does the, does the trick nicely. Um, yeah, around those they'll put a, a, a stripe so you know which end's which. This is the same reason the rancher uses a brand instead of a paragraph to identify his cow. <laughs> the opposition of the flow of a current in the direct in the direct current circuit is called resistance. Just like those beavers blocking up the current flow in a stream. The unit of resistance is the DC current is the ohm. The component is called the resistor. All right? Resistors is the one with all the stripes on it. We use an ohm meter to check the ohms of a resistor, or of resistance. All right. It's a basic ohm meter, and you just put it across the resistor, and it'll give you what it's valued at. Ham operators are about the, the last to enjoy the potentiometer. This is like an old-fashioned old rheostat. Has anybody heard either one of those words before? <laughs> All right. So it, it's uh, yeah, it's still like an old-fashioned real stat where the wiper brush makes contact with a wire winding, varying the resistance. This is found in volume controls of most handheld ham radios. New plasma, plasma TVs does not have potentiometers. Rather, volume is controlled by a digital push button circuit. In ham sets, we usually have the beloved potentiometer. Uh, and that's just a volume match. It's just a volume control on the top of your radio. You, got a, you, you basically got a potentiometer in your car radios and stuff like that, so, you know. That's what they are, but they just want you to know what it is. Uh, I figure a few more years you won't even have those. <laughs> you know? The potentiometer varies the resistance in most ham radio volume control circuits. If the ham radio does not have a round volume control knob, but a push button, but only push buttons for volume control, you don't have a potentiometer. They're already starting to change them over and ham radios now. Old time hams will lead you down to their basement to show you off their collection of multicolored glass power pole insulators. Clean glass is a great insulator and generally won't conduct electrons unless it gets covered with dirt or ocean salt air. Power pole maintenance workers use a special non-conductive water jet to clean the huge high voltage insulators. It is the coil called an insul inductor that stores energy in the magnetic field. We can actually see the effects of an inductor with a magnetic compass. The coil of wire is, is an inductor. All right, so that little co coil that you see in the picture 
is, is called an inductor. Remember that coils develop a magnetic field which can be detected by holding a magnetic compass held near the energized coil. Energy stored in the magnetic field is called inductance. The basic unit of inductance is the Henry because the Henry is a fairly large unit. We usually measure induction inductance in one thousandth of a Henry, a milli Henry, or one millionth of a Henry, a micro Henry. All right. Inductance is the Henry. That's the part you want to remember. Impedance is probably the most important concept to understand in all radios. It is a composite opposition to the flow of current in an AC or radio frequency circuit. It is sometimes erroneously called AC resistance, but it is an incomplete description. Impedance is the result of both resistance and reactance and is dependent on the frequency. Impedance represented by the letter Z is the total harmonic special resistance that opposes current flow within an alternating current circuit. Even though impedance is a complex had, yeah, is a complex number, it follows Ohm's law, which is fortunate. The unit of impedance just as resistance is the ohm. Ohm's law for impedance is A equals I times Z. All right, that's. Capacitors store energy in an electric field. This is called capacitance. The basic unit of capacitance is the farad. Because the farad is a fairly large unit, we usually measure capacitance in one millionth of a farad, microfarad, or one million millionth of a farad, picofarad. It is a capacitor that stores energy in the electric field. Got it? Electric field is the capacitor. The capacitor has two or more conductive surfaces separated by an insulator. When the capacitor shorts out or breaks down, it's usually an old one where the insulation has finally dried up, giving you all sorts of noise as a leaky old, older capacitor. A common switch is a component that connects or interrupts an electrical circuit cont uh, continuity. If the circuit is open, the circuit will not function. Close the switch, press till the radio comes back to life. Your new dual band handhelds turn on with either a volume control click or a keypad push button. If the handheld turns on and off with a volume control click, the switch totally turns off any battery drain to the inside electronics when you, when you turn the radio off. However, most handhelds have a soft push button turn on. And this type of, of transistor electronic switch always continues to draw a fraction of a milliamp when turned off. A soft turn-on switch may ultimately drain your radio's battery over a month, month's time, even when the equipment is off. Simply remove the battery if you plan not to use your gear for several months.
We use a fuse to protect the components from excessive amounts of current flow. Even handheld radio batteries have fuses in case you take in case you take a freshly charged battery and stick it in your pocket with a lot of spare change. The battery shorts out, you, you get a burning sensation in your thigh, but luckily the fuse will open up, hopefully, and all you'll get is a dead battery and a lot of hot quarters. Some batteries use thermal fuses, which automatically reset once they cool down. Always be sure to replace the fuse with a, one of the proper rating. Most battery packs have uh, some type of fuse circuit in it. Um, I have yet to see one that has the automatic reset. Uh, usually once you short them out, that's it. They're, they're gone. Here, here's a transistor capable of amplification as well as acting like one on an on-off switch. I don't know where that transistor is. <laughs> Most ham sets don't use tubes anymore. No tubes in that little dual band handheld. All transistors. Transistors are tiny electrical components capable of using a tiny voltage or current signal to control larger amounts of current flow in other circuits. Here's the transistor once again. It can act as a switch. It can act as a, it can also amplify signals. Remember transistor. Now this one here is showing you different uh, schematics of transistors. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know all of that. Uh, we use the word gain to describe how much transistors are is able to amplify a weak, a weak signal. The three terminals of a PNP or an NPN transistors are the emitter, the base, and the collector. Those were shown in that last picture. Very roughly equivalent to the cathode, the grid, and the anode of a triode vacuum tube. And I haven't seen a tube in years. Uh, there are three basic configurations of a transistor when used in an amplifier. Grounded common emitter, grounded common base, or grounded common collector, also, uh, also known as the emitter follower. These configurations are determined by which pairs of terminals are used as the input or output posts and have a great effect on the performance of the circuit application. Transistor is a funda fundamental solid state amplifier roughly equivalent to the trioid vacuum tube. Three layer bipolar transistor comes in two flavors, the NPN and the PNP, where, where N is the negative duped semiconductor material and the P is the positive duped semiconductor material. Fortunately, you don't need to know a great deal about the internal phys physics of a transistor. Thank God. Uh, even for the more advanced amateur licenses, you do need to understand how the device behaves and is used in radio electronic circuits. Modern ham radio equipment uses powerful transistors called field effect transistors, FETs. Field effect transistors can accomplish many functions within our ham radio equipment, providing voltage amplification where small changes in the gate voltages can trigger large changes in current flow, leading to voltage amplification. 
All right, and again, they show pictures of some of your transistors, or your, your, your FETs, rather. In many respects, the field effect transistor, or FET, is far more similar to a vacuum tube than normal bipolar transistors. The three elements of an FED are called source, gate, and drain, equivalent to the emitter, base, and collector in the bipolar transistors, res respectively. FETs have much higher terminal impedance than bipolar transistors, and the internal physics is much different. Hey, there's a tube. So your transistors are replaced, and the transistors and uh, uh, the other electronic components are replacing your tubes nowadays. All right, question pool. When I went through the questions at home, I don't remember any of those. No, I mean the, the section I just did. <laughs> well, I'm curious if that's the section I was doing. But anyways, here we go. What is the electrical term for an auto electromotive force, EMF, that causes an electron flow? Everybody thinks it's A, yeah? And you're right. What is the basic unit of electromotive force? And it's A. Which instrument would you use to measure electro electric potential or electromotive force? Anybody else? I got a B. We'll take B. Voltmeter. What is the correct way to connect the voltmeter to a circuit? And we'll go with the B again. Always in parallel. Which of the following battery types is, rechar is rechargeable? Anybody else? What What did you say? D. D? Go with D, all of them. Which of the follow battery types is not rechargeable? B, regular car carbon zinc batteries. How much voltage does a mobile transceiver usually require? A. Where should the negative return connection of a mobile transceiver power cable be connected. Okay. Good. What is the name of, of the flow of electrons in an electric circuit? D, that's the current. Which instrument is used to measure electric current? D, your amp meter. Okay. Yeah. Voltage is your voltmeter, current is your amp meter. How is an amp meter usually connected in the circuit? Anybody else? A is the correct answer, in series. Remember, voltage is directly across, amps is in series. Electrical current is measured in which of the following units? D is correct. Which of the following is a good electrical conductor? C, copper. 
What is the name for the current that reverses directions on a regular basis? Alternating current, your standard household current. Which of the following devices or circuits change alternating current into a varying direct current signal? That's your rectifier. What is the name for the current that flows only in one direction? Direct current. What electronic components allow current to flow in only one direction? Who said C? Ah, C is the one. <laughs> <laughs> now I know you're listening. <laughs> what are the names of the two electrodes of a diode? C. C. How is cathodoid lead of a semiconductor diode usually identified? With the stripe. What electric component is used to oppose the flow of current in a DC circuit? B. B. To oppose it, yes, resistance. What instrument is used to measure resistance? B. B, the ohm meter. Resistance is always ohms. What type of component is often used as a adjustable volume control? That's the potentiometer. What electrical per per parameter is controlled by a potentiometer? I got a D and I got a B. Okay. Potentiometer uh, varies the resistance of a circuit. Which of the following is a good electrical insulator? Glass. All right, remember, metal conducts glass and you know stuff like that. Pa you know, paper, wood does not conduct. What type of electrical component stores energy in a magnetic field? Inductor. Inductor. Remember the coil. All right. What electrical comp component usually composed of a coil of wire? Inductor. I just said it, the coil. <laughs> what is the ability to store energy in a magnetic field called? There. Good thing I didn't say my answer. I probably would have got it wrong. What is the basic unit of inductance? Henry. What is meant by the term impedance? All right, the measure of opposition from AC current flow in a circuit. What are the units of impedance? Ohms. Yep. What is the ability to what is the ability to store energy in electric sir, field called? It's storing electric capacitance. 
Um, if you ever get around to working on any electronics equipment, capacitors are something you want to watch out for. All right, you turn a, turn a unit off, either let it sit there for a, a long time, I'm, I'm getting ready to try to repair a TV, and they recommend leaving it off for 24 hours before you start working on it. Let the, let the thing drain its power out. Or you will know it. What is the basic unit of capacitance? Hey, the farad. What electrical component stores energy in an electric field? Capacitor. What type of electrical component consists of or more conductive surfaces separated by an insulator? Anybody? Capacitor. All right. Now, you know, it's, it's funny because if you look at this question, the answers to this question, C you can eliminate immediately because I don't remember saying anything about oscillators. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, but it's, you know, so capacitor. What electrical component is used to connect or disconnect electrical circuits? Switch, B, yep. What electrical component is used to protect other circuit components from current overloads. Hey, that's the fuse. Which of the component which of these components can be used as a electronic switch or amplifier? B. What was that? I said B. You said B. <coughs> Alright, I got B. What else we got? C. C? C, the transistor. Potentiometer, if it has the on-off click, yes. can be, could, be, could be right, but transistors are used more nowadays than anything else. Okay. What class of electronic components is capable of using a voltage or current signal to control current flow? Transistors. Which of the following electronic components can amplify signals? Please. Transistors. I mean, they said transistors can do a, a few things, you know. Uh, they control the they control the flow of electrons, or the, the, the electricity. Um, so the the transistor can tell another unit, here's more electric for you to do your job better, you know, and that that can amplify. What is the term used to describe a transistor's ability to amplify a signal? A is gain. Yep. What are the three electrodes of a PNP or NPN transistor? B. All right, transistors. All right, transistors is the emitter, the base, and the collector. So, which of the following components can be made of three layers of semiconductor material. That's the transistor again. What does the abbreviation FET stand for? Oh, A, field effect transistors. 
What are the three electrodes of a field effect transistor? What is it? B. Yeah, if you uh, try and remember the NPN and the PNP is your emitter base collector. Your transistors are your source gate and drain. Anybody else need a quick break or? Okay. That's good. What's that? Yeah? Turn it on. No, because it charges the capacitor again. That's what I mean. Well, yeah, but how many, how many, well, in the old days, I'd agree with you. Now I can't, because if you unplug it, your remote's not going to work on it. The on-off switches aren't going to work, because they're all soft switches. Oh, I didn't know Yeah. In the old days, I mean capacitors, in the old days you had the tubes with the big metal tip on top and you used to be able to open everything up and take a large screwdriver and zap them to drain everything off. But you had to be very careful doing it. So. All right, let's see if I can get through this next section here. I think somebody's in for a surprise later on. <laughs> All right. Whoops. Oh, come on. All right. It's the law, Mr. Ohm. Now, this is Ohm's law power formulas. Um, I would recommend you to look it up if you got time on the internet or whatever and print it out and look it over because that's that's all your formulas that you use for calculating different values. Alright. Um, the, the actual circle that they have here, if you were that's energy, voltage, if you were looking for the voltage of a circuit, you'd put your thumb over that and it would tell you you want the value of I times R to get the voltage. All right? That's why that they put it in that symbol. Anything up on top is divided by these. Anything down below is times over here. Uh, so if you were looking for, let's say, the current in this one, uh, you'd cover that up and you'd have to get the voltage and the resistance, divide the resistance into the voltage, and it'll give you that result, okay? And they show you all that down here. So that's a good uh, chart to remember. You know, it's, it's actually something you should look up, and, but you won't need to look it up because you're going to pass it today. What am I talking about, you know? All right. 
It's the law, Mr. Ohm. Go outside your home or condo and gaze at the power meter, measuring the rate at which electrical energy is being consumed by all the gadgets inside your shack or your home. Luckily, your modern hand gear won't consume much energy, so your power bill won't go up by more than a few cents per month. Oh, yeah? What power meter, the, that power meter on the side of your house is called a watt meter. It's calculating your household voltage times the amount of amperes of current flowing to keep your radio station powered up. Power is energy. Power is measured in watts. Power in watts is equal to volts times current in amps. Okay. A 100 watt light bulb running on 110 volts household current household voltage will draw about 1 amp. <coughs> the magic circle of power power over E times I cover the unknown uh, quantity with your finger perform the mathematical operation represented by measuring quantities. All right, and that's how you, you calculate stuff. That's what I was just saying about putting your thumb over the, the one you're looking for and, and locating the other two figures. Um, I laugh every time I look at the meter, stuff about meters on your house. I go out and look at mine and I get sick. <laughs> but, you know, um, it's because I run a lot of stuff in the house, so. Power is equal to volts times amps. In this problem, multiply 13.8 volts by 10 amps, and you end up with 138 watts. This one you can do in your head. Easy as pie. I come up with pie. Power is equal to volts times amps. Multiply 12 volts by 2.5 amps and you end up with 30 watts. Now they got uh, the answers you know, in red, so uh, remember those answers, okay? This time we're calculating for amps. So the power is 120 divided by the volts of 12. Do the keystrokes. Uh, they're telling you to do it by calculator. So it's 120 divided by 12 equals 10. All right, just, uh, again, just because the power, the list power second in the question, it still gives P on the top. Um, and your voltage first in the question that goes on the bottom is, is the E. All right, so, you know, remember everything above the line is a divide from whatever's below. Everything with the line vertical, uh, you're multiplying across. So, um, and Peter, did we mention to them they're allowed to have calculators at all or? Yeah, you can have calculators as long as there's no formulas on them. Right. If any formulas on them, we have to take them. Um, you know, you know, nothing that can give away answers to the test. But to do the basic math, we can have calculators. Did anybody bring a calculator with them today? No? You can't use one on your phone because your phones will have to be off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, voltage equals current times resistance, which is expressed as E equals I times R. This simple formula called Ohm's Law states the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance in an electrical, electrical circuit. Since we're looking at the E in this question, the voltage ac across the resistor cover the E with your finger, and you now have I, which is the amps, which is 
times ohms, which is 2. Simple multiply the two values to obtain the answer. So 0.5 times 2 is going to give you 1 volt. On your calculator, which is perfectly legal, uh, <laughs> perfectly legal in the exam, perform the following keystrokes, and it tells you how to do it. So. For, for right now, All right, the question starts out, what is the voltage across? So put your finger over the, across the E and see what the current is in the question, one amps, through the 10, 10 uh, ohm resistor. Multiply 10, oh, mul one multiplied by 10 is 10. You can do this in your head normally. As you can see, I didn't. But that's why, that's why I say these these charts they show you the I over the uh, the E over the IR and the P over the the other two that I forgot already. Uh, if you can get them and look them over, it's to your benefit. This question is looking for voltage, so we know we're going to be. Simple multiplication, two amps through a 10, 10 ohm resistor with 20 volts. Well, 20 volts is your correct answer. So again, you're putting your finger over the E and your times in the uh, I and the R, the two and the 10, and you get 20 volts. So. Again, they got the 20 in the red, so you know that's going to show up somewhere. For current, put your finger over the I, and it's the, vol uh, the voltage divided by the resistance. Does everybody understand the concept of that? They show you the circle with, you know, keep it in your head. This is due to keystrokes. 240 divided by 24 is going to equal 10. All right. Be careful on this question. They reversed the order of the resistance and the voltage that was in the previous question. In your magic circle, I equals 200 divided by 100. You calculate your your Thing and you're going to come up with two amps. Here they want to know current. So the voltage, 120 volts, divided by the resistance of 80 amps or 80 ohms, uh, and that gives you the keystroke for it. You know, it says just be careful not to reverse your direction or your division. Um, okay. So the answer on that one's 1 1.5 amps. Put your finger over the resistance in the circle and see that it's the voltage divided by current. R equals I over, or divided by I. <coughs> All right, again, they listed things a little backwards here, but they list cur uh, per current first, which would go in the bottom of your magic circle, the voltage on the top. So you got the, uh, you're gonna clear, clear, and then 90, which is your, re your resistance times your 3, which is your voltage, and you're going to come up with 30 ohms. All right, in this problem, they listed the voltage first, which is 12 on the top, divided by 1.5 amps on the bottom. So again, it's the top divided by the bottom. So you're going to have 12 divided by 1.5, which is going to give you a 
an answer of 8 ohms. So it's, it's a very simple process once you grasp it. It took me a while to grasp it, but it, it got there. So we read each question carefully before they, because they switch around voltage and current. <clears throat> Yet the magic circle always says to put the voltage on the top and the current on the bottom. Now remember, on most technician class questions, you, you divide the larger number by the smaller number. And presto, you'll end up with the correct answer. 12 divided by 4 equals 3. Correct? Okay. And I have absolutely no clue as to that chart. So, we will go on. All right, here's your questions. Which term describes the rate at which electric electrical energy is used? Power. Electrical power is, measure, is measured in which of the following units? Watts. What is the formula you'll use to calculate electric power in a DC circuit? There you go. Power equals voltage times the current. How much power is being used in a circuit in a circuit when the applied voltage is 13.8 volts DC and the current is 10 amps? Yeah, you remembered that red print, didn't you? <laughs> How much power is being used in a circuit when the voltage is 12 and the current is 2.5? Well, 30 watts. How many amperes are flowing in a circuit when the applied voltage is 12 and the load is 120 watts? B, 10 amps. <coughs> That's 12 divided into 120. What formula is used to calculate voltage in a circuit? So we got A. A is the correct answer. Again, remember the circle. E is on the top. So if you're looking at the, this answer here, I and R are multiplied. So that's the only possible right answer for that one. What is the voltage across a 2 amp resistor if the current is 0.5 amps? One volt, yep. What is the voltage across the 10 ohm resistor if the current of 1 amp flows through it? B, 10 volts. All right. What is the voltage across the 10 amp resistor or 10 ohm resistor if the current is 2 amps and it flows through it? D? D, 20 volts. What formula is used to calculate current in a circuit? B. B is the correct answer. 
again, if you can remember that pie chart, that, that, that's going to be a good thing for you. What is the current flowing through a 24 ohm resistor connected across 240 volts? C, 10 amps. What is the current flowing through a 100 ohm resistor connected across 200 volts? C, C. C 2 amps. <laughs> so I said, you got you to actually look at them and, and think about it for a second before you jump because you got to look and say, what, what are they asking for, you know? What is the current flow in a circuit with a applied voltage of 120 volts and a resistance of 80 ohms? Where did the 80 disappear to? <laughs> 1.5, yep. What formula is used to calculate resistance in a circuit? Okay, again, remember the pie chart. E is on top. So E over anything on the bottom is a division. All right? Anything on the bottom going across is multiplication. So if they're looking for resistance, which is on the bottom, it means your E is going to be divided by something on the bottom. So your answer is B. What is the resistance of a circuit in which current is 3 amps flows through a resistor connected at 90 volts? B, 30 ohms. What is the resistance in a circuit which is 12 volts and the current is 1.5 amps? What is the resistance in a circuit that draws 4 amps from a 12 volt source? There you go. Where the hell they go? We'll have to find something. Say what now? Okay. I guess we're on to football. Run some interference protection. 
This particular question is about four signal reports from your radio through the repeater and has a correct to answer showing all of the conditions that might lead to the bad reception. Likely a bad location in one of those, not spots, could lead to the distorted or weak signal. So try not, uh, try moving to a slightly different location where the signal strength of the repeater shows greater on your handheld LCD graph and that you should probably go to a better spot which you can transmit through the repeater. Uh, anybody familiar with old fire department uh, Motorola pagers? Everybody did the Motorola shuffer? When the tones went out you had to kind of go, yeah, move to a better location. Chances are your TV, your routers throw a lot of, as Cody found out this morning, yeah, in a close proximity depending on how high you have the power on your router. It could throw off specifically 910's repeater in my house. I have tin ceilings, copper ceilings, <laughs> and a router. So signals are absolutely horrible in our house. So just by changing a room, if you walk outside, everything will clear up for you. Some base station radios for weak signal VHF and UHF operation have a microphone gain control. Set the gain control to about half scale. Turning the control up wide open will set the mic gain too high and cause the signal, uh, the transmitted signal to become distorted. Um, most HTs have mic gains on them. Um, start off, I would start, because I have a rather deeper voice, I start off at about three and work my way up from there. So some people that don't gen generally tend to use it, you'll see them screaming into their cell phones, those folks, or their radios, thinking that the louder they scream, but the louder you try to talk into your mic, the worse it's gonna be anyway, so. Use the, use the mic gain when you can. If, you set, if your set is over deviating, it means that you have too much modulation is being driven into your signal beyond the normal bandwidth. If you talk farther from the mic, you will minimize and eliminate some of your deviation. So uh, particularly Allie and I work in a spot where the lady that's running the show at night, instead of having the mic at a comfortable distance, she likes to scream loudly into the mic and you can't understand a word Chrissy says. <laughs> having your mic uh, set too high, I didn't do this one. Having your microphone gain set too high will cause excessive deviation and is uh, the primary cause of FM transmitters using up too much of the spectrum space. While most of the modern handhelds and portable rigs have deviation limiters, these can get out of adjustment from time to time, obviously, from cleaning and whatever. Uh, if someone tells you that you have an over-deviating, if you're over-deviating, simply back off from the microphone an inch or two which will reduce the modulation until you can get uh, your radio fixed or adjust it the way you need to. On a multi-mold weak, weak signal radio, uh, when you receive a weak signal, sideband signal, turn on the noise blanker to minimize uh, the ignition noise. Uh, so that, I imagine they're gonna ask that one. Uh, there is no noise blanker function on a common FM handheld or mobile radio just on the bigger high frequency multi-mode transmitter. So these we really don't have to worry about too much. It's when you start getting in the one, what was this, Doug, yesterday? Showed you in the car, in his trunk? Phil. Oh, Phil. Uh, that's when your major adjustments are gonna start coming into play. You have a brand new mobile radio installed in your brand new car. You rewarded yourself for passing the test today. But uh, each time you go, you goose the accelerator, high, you hear a high-pitched noise coming from your mobile radio speaker. The most common, uh, it's most commonly called alternator whine. And it can be minimized by a DC filter choke and alternator filters. They're really easy, and I don't have one with me. Um, kind of looks like this. If I unplug it, we'll be good, briefly. Everybody's seen one of these either on our cell phones or some sort of gadget that we got, iPads, tablets, or something like that. Uh, yeah. So it's a simple fix. It used to be we could go to Radio Shack and 
pick up a quick choke filter, you kind of wrap your cable up and around and then just snapped it shut. But apparently we're losing Radio Shack, so. This is a common problem in handhelds plugged into a 12 volt accessory socket in your automobile. If your automobile it has a hefty alternator charging system without filters on it, on the leads, the AC from the alternator will put a high pitch whine into your uh, transmit and receive signal. If you hear a signal noise, it changes. Uh, you, when you accelerate, come back down in pitch. As you let off the gas, plan to buy some DC noise filters, noise filters and put them in both electrical systems, as well as your uh, handheld 12 volt DC input cord. Most cars uh, adapter plugs for handhelds have a built-in noise choke to minimize that common problem. I can't remember when it started, but uh, probably in the last five years that's kind of taken care of itself. But most of the cords, if you buy the accessories, I'd say about 80% of them already come with some sort of a choke on it. So, you know, when you buy one from eBay, just see if there's something weird on a cord. That's probably your filter. RF radio frequency. That's RF. Current flow on the outside of a microphone cable and other conductors as well is generally a common uh, mode sort, which normally most effective cured by the use of a ferrite beads or cores surrounding the conductor, thus choking off the RF current. Sometimes reducing the RF problem is a bit of an art form. But always start with the standard fixes first. If you plan to go digital with your new tech class privileges, load up on a handful of ferrite chokes. Again, they're really cheap and pretty easy to put on. It's one of the easiest things anybody can do. Um, these are clamshell iron devices that simply snap over the wiring coming from your Antennas you so choose to choose um, have, uh, like mine came, it, it looks like a PVC pipe. It's just a weird looking thing. And you would plug your antenna from the antenna into this and then from the bottom of that into your base station. And that giant thing on an exterior antenna is uh, an RF choke. In any interference case, you want to be sure that you have a clean house to start with. Assuming that you're transmitting a clean signal, the situation indicates cable leakage, which can result from any one of possibly a dozen of improperly installed cable connectors in a cable TV installation. I have a tendency, if I have a problem, to rip it all apart. Sometimes it's a matter of if you're moving your base station just a little bit in different directions because you've got your computer screens or whatever in the way and you just need that little bit more space, sometimes just the movement back, forth, left, or right will loosen up your connectors in the back. So when you have a problem, I tend not to start with the simple stupid stuff. Just tighten that connector, check the connectors first. <laughs> yeah, I, it's Italian German crap. Now that the television signals are digital and a majority are now transmitted over the air on UHF frequencies, ham radio television interference, TVI, is a rarity. Uh, your worldwide radio already comes with low pass filters installed uh, to remove harmonics. On the UHF and VHF bands, no filter should ever be added to your antenna system. Uh, but to answer the question correctly, if you decide to add a low pass filter, to the antenna connection. Of your, it goes in between the transmitter and the antenna. That was on my test. It goes in between the transmitter and the antenna. Uh, gone are the days, if anybody had DSL, if you had DSL, you knew about the stupid filters you had to add to your phone line to kill that stuff. Um, you are outside sitting on your deck chair listening to your local repeater when all of a sudden your handheld picks up nothing but hash. Your buddy across the street, also a ham, is transmitting with his mobile radio and amplifier that he bought off of a swap meet net 
and was advertised as may need some tweaking. <laughs> that nearby transmitter is probably overloading your receiver with harmonics and sparse emissions. And all this leads to the radio frequency interference. But don't, uh, don't buy questionable used gear. Marconi himself probably couldn't fix. It's uh, buy at your own risk. If people uh, tweak their amplifiers, move things around, uh, I'm not good at wiring. I'm colorblind. Can't solder much. <laughs> I can't really do a lot of things. Colorblind on top of it all. Uh, so to get into an amplifier and see the black diode or cathode with the gray stripe and the gray resistor with the black stripe, I'm out of the game. So I tend to just, if you're going to buy one, it would probably behoove you to start off in the beginning if you're going to have an amp or something like that to buy a new one, you know, instead of buying one for a, half the price and then wind up having issues. But swap meets are fun. We've got a lot of good stuff out there. You're on the six meters for the first time and the signal strength test with hams a few miles away indicate that you're having a strong signal, but your modulation, the voice, is slightly garbled. This is most likely because of RF feedback between your antenna system and the microphone. Um, you have the antenna temporarily set up on a tripod just a few feet away from an operating station. Get some longer coax. Move the antenna about 15 feet away from your operating station. And likely your friends will be able to tell you that your distortion is cleared up. No more RF feedback. Most antennas recommend a certain footage of coax. If they, I think the, the lowest one I had recommended 50 feet. So if you cut that in half, you're going to start having issues. So even if you have to make a, a, ghost, a ghost choke or something like that, and that's just merely taking a cable and taking a coffee can and winding it around that, that'll help clear that up if you, ha if you have to shorten it. But if it recommends 50 feet, I would probably stick with the 50 feet. All electrical inductors are capable of both radiating and receiving uh, radio frequency energy. This is a great, uh, in the case of an antenna, that is not so great in the most popular applications. When you don't, when you don't want a conductor to radiate or receive radio signals or other air interference, um, the use of shielding is also an effective solution. The most fam uh, familiar shielding wire is a coax cable. It is unlikely that UHF and VHF uh, signals will cause television interference to your neighbors on the outside antenna or the dish or cables. However, if you go out into the worldwide bands using the Morse code privileges, be aware that these frequencies could sneak into a television set and cause problems. First, double check that your equipment is well grounded and operating properly. And double check that your TV is working OK. Uh, when you're transmitting over the air. If it is, chances are your neighbors may have some loose connections on their TV receivers. And this would uh, cure it up by a sweep towards the reducing the interference from your station when transmitting on high frequency. I don't know if it's in this, but maybe Dave. Uh, if your neighbors complain that you're interfering with their TV, what do we do? And if they become bad neighbors and start telling you, you have to break down your station, do we have to break down our station? No. As long as we know that it's running properly, everything is connected, and we're within your licensing class. If you're running 3,000 watts of power and you spin your beam into his antenna, yeah, you might have a problem. <laughs> but as long as we're operating properly, the neighbors can complain all they want, and you really don't have to dis dismantle your entire station because he gets a little flutter or here's a little CW. Interferences between am amateur radio service has always been potential problems uh, through and in regards, it's not as severe as it once was. A broadcast TV signal changed from analog to digital, uh, the disappearance of Channel 2 TV, for, uh, for instance, has made a full power six-meter amateur radio a joy in recent years. 
where in the past it was almost certain to cause interference by near, uh, nearby analog TVs on that channel. In any case, it, it behooves any amateur to understand some of the rudimentary uh, rudiments of <laughs> preventing and curing various forms of RF interference as they might crop up. Often, however, the problem is design effects of the consumer electronic device. A small degree of wisdom or a lot of experience is often necessary to resolve the issues. Each case is a special case. You may not experience what I do and I may not experience what you do. Again, you may have a normal house. We got a house covered in copper and tin. So a lot of inf interference, everybody's different. You may purchase a snap-on ferrite choke that acts as an RF filter on your telephone equipment, just like the old uh, DSL stuff. Snap these filters over the telephone cord, the telephone's curly cord, and actually in becoming uh, the incoming line from the phone to your handset. The more snap-on filters you add, the less likely your little handheld or base station will cause interference. Again, that's not really I've never had it, so I'm not saying other people have, since DSL is pretty much gone. The best way to correct radio frequency interference from your ham radio to your mother-in-law's hi-fi and ancient analog TV <laughs> is to use a snap on fire right choke and rely on your own equipment's uh, bandpass filters to keep the transmit signal clean. Hopefully that old TV set has its own high-pass filter built on. For the worldwide ham bands, newer ham rigs have low-pass filters built right in, and in rare cases you could actually build a short stub band reject filter for that old TV set. For the exam, all these choices are correct. So a snap-on ferrite choke, high-pass band, low-pass filters, short stub band reject filters for the old, old school TVs. All right, so all the, those answers are correct. But in the real world of ham radio, the very best way of eliminating your lovely voice from coming over your mom-in-law's hair dryer and toaster would be to snap on a ferrite choke, especially useful in computer leads, um, telephone modems, hi-fi connections, um, and incoming telephone lines. This stuff generates a lot of interference. So if you have your monitor sitting here, your PCs on the tower here, you got all your USB connections, your ports, your hubs, and all that stuff, it's generating a lot of interference for your radio. So it's, chances are it's not the radio that's causing it, it's all the other stuff. His brother has his radio too close to his computer and he has to take it and move it, what, about half a foot on his desk? and it clears up all the radio problems, so. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm laughing. No mother-in-law does. <coughs> so there's a, uh, there's your high cut, low cuts, and how the filters work, and that bypass filter in between your receiver and antenna. Unfortunately, a lot of consumer equipment is designed and built as if they were the only occupants of the radio spectrum. No matter how much, uh, how pristine and clean your amateur radio signal is, some type of interference such as front, front end overload can be uh, fixed, can only be fixed at the consumer equipment. This is just uh, one such case, consult the ARRL handbook and other reputable references for detailed information on how to apply filters to consumer gear for the solution. Uh, plus, if you are on air, pretty much I, I would have to say, Dave, Pete, I, we will try to help as much as possible. Any ham is, it's amazing how the ham community comes together. Hey, I broke my antenna. Here. I got one in the trunk, take it for now until you get it fixed, you know. Part 15 devices are unlicensed devices that use low power radio signals. Um, is your phone part 15? 
I'm not sure about all the brands, but you know, unlicensed devices that use low power radio signals. They are prohibited from causing interference to other licensed devices, such as amateur radio, and must accept any, interfer inter any, mm, any interference from duly licensed transmitters, amateur or otherwise. Unfortunately, interference from the Part 15 devices to amateur radio is relatively rare, but you need to know that they're out there. A, wire, a wireless anything is likely to be rated as a Part 15 device, and this means that the potential of ham radio interference. As more wireless Part 15 devices switch from analog to digital, or ham uh, transmitters probably won't disturb them anymore. And there's what I asked the question about to Dave. Or to, uh, Dave. Work with your neighbors to identify the offending device. Politely inform the neighbor about the rules that prohibit the use of devices which cause interference because it's never theirs. It's always you because you're pushing power out of an antenna. So it's always us that are causing the problems. Uh, check with your station and make sure that it meets the standards of good amateur practice. And all of these are, choices are correct. Do what we can to keep our stuff clean and running and set. So question time. I already know the answer to this. You're all going to get them right. Because that's all I hear through the mic. Yep, yep, yep. I hear everybody's getting it. What might be the problem if you receive a report that your radio signal through the repeater is distorted or unintelligible? See? See? All of these. Your battery is important. Uh, if it doesn't have uh, whatever it is, 7.4 volts, as it starts to drain, you could be in a bad location, move, move a couple of feet. And we don't have to worry about much being off frequency on these guys because it kind of is what it is, you know? What may happen if your transmitter is operated with a microphone gain set too high? What do you do if you're told that your FM handheld or mobile transceiver is over-deviating? Oh, you don't scream into it? What could cause your FM signal to interfere with stations on nearby frequencies? Got it? SWR, it's kind of, especially on these, it kind of is where it is. Uh, CTCSS tone, this means if you key up, you're not going to hit the repeater if you don't have that right. And so it would be your gain is too high. Which of the following would you uh, reduce ignition ear interference to your receiver? Turn on the noise blanker or any other types of filters that you have on board. What is the source of a high-pitched whine that varies with the engine speed in a mobile transceiver, transceiver's radio? The alternator, alternator whine. What could happen if another operator reports a variable high-pitched whine on the audio from your mobile transmitter. Hmm? That's right. Again, back to that alternator. Which one of the following could you use to cure distorted audio caused by RF current flowing on the shield of a microphone cable? I got a B and a D. D. What's that? You'll say D? D. 
First time ever I saw all of you with a different one. It's a ferrite choke, the little snap-on jobs. What might be the first step to resolve a cable TV interference from your ham radio transmission? D? Always check the dumb stuff first. Because I got, I don't know how they make those cable TV boxes when you got to screw that little F connector in there. Those fingers just don't work. That's why they have a special tool that they use. <laughs> Where must a filter be installed to reduce harmonic emissions from your station? Which of the following may be cause of radio frequency interference? Oh, that was that easy, huh? What is the symptom of RF feedback in a transmitter or transceiver? Which of the following is a common reason to use shielded wire? Which of the following actions should you take if your neighbor tells you that your station's transmission are interfering with the radio or TV reception and it does not include punching them in the throat? What would cause a uh, broadcast AM or FM radio to receive an amateur radio transmission unintentionally? It's the receiver is unable to reject the strong signals outside the AM or FM. Which of the following is a way to reduce or eliminate interference by an amateur transmitter to a nearby telephone? RF is killer, absolutely killer to us. Which of the following may be useful in uh, correcting an, the radio frequency interference problem? You got the snap-ons, you got the low and high pass, and the band reject for the mom-in-law's house. <laughs> how can you overload, uh, how can an overload of non-amateur radio equipment receiver by an amateur signal be reduced in one and or eliminated? Filters, filters, filters. What is a part 15 device? What should you do if something in your neighborhood, uh, in your neighbor's home is causing harmful interference to your amateur radio station? Picture this. Is it me again? Yeah. Yay. Picture that. As a new tech operator, you will be uh, familiar with the identification of simple schematic diagram illustrations. In the next few questions, we'll take a look at some of those schematics with symbols that you should know. We will, uh, we will home in. Oh, home in on identifying individual symbols and schematic diagrams for your exam. Don't panic, it's easy. Ha ha. Now let's check ourselves. The symbols on the electrical circuit schematic diagram represent electrical components. 
So in red, schematics represent electrical, the symbols represent the electrical components. Before the meeting started, some of these will actually be on the test this afternoon. Unfortunately. Not many. At least I didn't have that many. Schematic diagrams allow us to see exactly how the components are interconnected right down to each and every lead. I hope that you can see that. Okay. The schematic diagram allows you to see exactly how the components are interconnected. Another figure, component number three, doesn't have a squiggly line like a resistor, but rather a coil type line. So this is a variable conductor. So the squiggly line is a variable conductor. It is a it's a variable because we see tap points on the hump lines and a line with the arrow indicating the inductor that can be adjusted uh, to any tap. Welcome. Again. Component number four looks like it. An antenna. That antenna tuned by someone of the preceding circuit components. We use series and parallel coils and capacitors to develop a tuned circuit inside the new radio. Another name for a coil is an inductor, and it's what we use. Uh, it's used with a capacitor so that you have a tuned circuit. And there is a bunch of your signals. Yeah, that's a lot, but it's okay. <laughs> I know everybody looks at it and goes, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Squiggly lines, hump lines. A resonant circuit must contain at least one inductor and one capacitor. So on question number T6D11, a resonant circuit, inductor capacitor, the keywords. The resonant frequency of the tuned circuit is a frequency at which the inductive reactants and the capacitance reactants are equal. It is one of the most uh, crucial circuits in the radio. Resonant circuits of, the, of one form or another determine the frequency of operation on all radio devices. Here we go, a bunch of squigglies, antennas, and forks. Uh, this figure will be found on your actual technical and technician class exam sheet. Either with the question or with the last page of your examination materials, component number one, that squiggly line, is a resistor. Can you imagine current flowing through all the squiggly, uh, squigglies offering resistance? Component two is our friendly transistor. The arrow is not pointing in. So it is an NPN transistor. I think Dave showed that a, a good diagram of an, uh, of an NPN earlier. Component number two is an NPN transistor. And this one controls the flow of current. So the NPN transistor controls the flow of current much like a value. Component three, this looks like what it is, a small inductor lamp. Looks like a lamp, doesn't it? Looks like an LED. It takes voltage to make this, cir this circuit work. And we get the voltage from the battery which is component number four. Component, do what? Oh, okay, big finger, sorry. Your handheld may have one of these, a single pole, single throw switch. This is, it is single on both sides, both senses, because you see only one wiring going to the switch and only one single contact point. Single pull, single throw. Component number four takes in everything around it, and it is usually a transformer. I'm sure everybody's seen one of these. In old, old radios or stuff that we broke. <laughs> Voltage is passed from one winding on the left side to windings on the right, with two vertical lines representing an iron core. This transformer looks to have about the same number of turns on the primary or secondary. So the amount of voltage going in will be the same as the amount of voltage coming out the other side. Same in, same out. 
Okay. You guys are great. Let's turn it into a master engineer. Took figure T2, component 6, has two parallels, sort of. The plates are separated by insulators, or insulation, so it must be a capacitor. And a capacitor, capacitor does what? See the little arrow symbol on the component number 8 showing the effects of light? Component 8 is a light-emitting diode, LED. 